Happy Sabbath, church. I want to just draw your attention to some of the announcements for uh, our church, uh, Wednesday prayer meetings. And I just want to talk about that just for a, a little bit. If you believe in prayer, you should engage in it and you should uh, use that tool even much more now, right? All you have to do is just look at what's happening in our nation, what's happening in our church. And, and, and you, if you feel helpless, then you should fall to your knees. Even if you don't feel helpless, because you do have tools, you can write your senator, um, you can write your conference, you should still fall to your knees. Open up your Bible and pray individually. But not only individually, at Wednesday, every Wednesday at 6, this church comes together to pray. Uh, in addition to us coming together Wednesday to pray, we want this next week, every day, for all of the church members to pray for our nation, um, with the things that we're going through right now, and for our church, uh, with, it seems like uh, some of our freedoms are being squashed or not taken as seriously. So those are the two things we want you to pray about. When you in your prayer closet or you're on your own time praying, and we want you to pray for our nation and pray for our church. And that's important. And then come and join us on Wednesdays at 6 as we pray together. I remember one of the first things when I got here and I loved about this church, and Pastor Tanya, I think you're going to love it too, is that this church is a church that says you don't ever have to pray alone. You never have to pray alone. Uh, and that not just on Wednesdays, at any time, if you think that you need your brothers and sisters, your church family to pray with you, pick up the phone and give us a call, and we will be able to pray for you. So Wednesdays at 6, we will have our regular prayer meeting. And then Friday at 7 o'clock, we have our youth. Uh, it's like an a, a AYS, an MV. It's something that is put together for the youth, and it's by the youth. And it's just talking about youth things, and it's really good. If you are a youth, then you will like it. The adults, this is not the adults telling you what you need to study, but it's just you guys saying, man, we want to study this and see what the Word of God has to say. Also at 7, there is um, a Bible study about the Holy Spirit and how we, that is what we need during this time. You're invited to join us with that as well. 8 a.m., um, I think we're going to continue this. 8 a.m., even when the church shuts down for these three weeks, uh, you will be able to see for the first time the Sabbath school lesson uh, for that week, and it'll be on our website. People from not just the youth, but young adults, they deal, deal with some straight, some real topics, um, and they get a lot of uh, some of their special guest speakers. Uh, we had an NF NFL player. Uh, we've had some of our, our GC representatives. Um, talking about real issues during the quarantine. And you know, this quarantine, this, this COVID has brought up, uh, brought to light some of the other issues um, that we don't even think about. So these are some of the things that we invite you to, um, to join us on Zoom and that your church is doing. Some of the ministries, you know, that you don't see, the, the, the families that, that we are feeding and the uh, those that have been affected financially by the COVID or mentally by the COVID, the visitations that your church is ministering, you don't see some of these things. Um, but if you go online, you can see how you can be a part of that. Um, that's, you know, that's where your offering dollars go to. And like always, we like to end the Sabbath. This Sabbath will be no, no difference with prayer. Um, so we invite you at 6 o'clock to join us for prayer as we end this Sabbath day. And those are some of the things that your church is doing. Go online and you can see uh, what the men's ministry is doing, the women's ministry uh, will be doing, kids' ministry, and all of that is on our uh, the website, www.lnsda.com.
Good morning, church. It's wonderful to have you here today, Sabbath, even if it's only virtually. Today we're going to talk about our opportunities for offerings. We have um, the church here all torn up, and we're working on the AV. Um, that's all going to look completely different when you return. We're excited to have this, this moving forward. We still need a little bit more money for refurbishment of the foyer, so keep that in your prayers and in your offerings for us, and always our church budget. There's one more um, project that we're starting, and as this COVID, as you know, is kind of being a roller coaster, we're opening and closing and opening and closing. We're setting up an area outside where we can have our services in the fresh and open air. And so pray for that project too. Um, right now, I think we have enough funds for it. If we don't, we'll let you know. But just pray that that happens quickly, that project is, can be completed so that we can move outdoors. Uh, and also, 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 our church budget is, is always in need of your prayers and always in need of your, your giving. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful Sabbath. Lord, we pray that you would be with each person that is listening and watching today. We pray, Lord, for your covering of protection over them that you will protect them from this virus, that you will halt this pandemic in its tracks, Lord. That no, we, we claim the promise that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And so we just pray that, Lord, against this virus as it continues to move across our country. Lord, we thank you that your spirit is with us we thank you that your Holy Spirit is directing and guiding us. We thank you too, Lord, for the great gift that you give us of your son Jesus, for the death, his death on the cross, Lord, for our ability to have a hope in eternal life and salvation. Lord, as we see things happening in this world, we just pray that you will come quickly and we will soon be able to worship and be home with you. That is our longing and our desire, Lord. We pray today as that you will be with the speaker, give them boldness of your spirit, open our hearts to the words that you would have us to hear. Lord, it's so wonderful that we can turn to you when for everything, in our joys, in our sorrows, just thank you for being there and caring for us. And thank you for the blessing of Sabbath. These things we ask and pray and just rejoice in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy to be here with you this morning. And I uh, feel like that we're all together, even though you're not sitting here in the church. I know that you're in your homes, and we are still the church of God, and so it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you, speaking to you, and uh, may God's uh, grace add to the words I say, and may they touch your heart. Today I'd like to talk about a, an old topic in the church, um, probably as uh, one of the oldest that comes along with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'd like to talk about the Sabbath. It's a, it's a topic that we as Seventh-day Adventists might consider that has been overdone, something that, why should we talk about this? We've been talking about this for over 150 years. Um, Sabbath, we, we've, we've covered it backwards and forwards. But sometimes when we do that, we, as time goes on, we seem to forget some of the, the fundamentals. Some of our first love is forgotten. And so for that reason, perhaps maybe just for the first love of the Sabbath and for why God brought it for us, I'd like to revisit that topic this morning. My topic is, is called, Why is the Sabbath so important? I just want to take a few minutes today to address this question. Why is the Sabbath so important? As Seventh-day Adventists, think about it. This is in our name. 
Seventh-day Adventists. We, we consider this such an important and vital topic that we named ourselves Seventh-day Adventist. We could have just, you know, like many churches, called ourselves Crosswalk, Crossroads, Grace Church, something generic. We picked a rather ungeneric name, Seventh Day, because the Sabbath has serious meaning to us. It separates us from all other Christian churches. Maybe there are one or two, some smaller denominational churches that keep the Seventh Day Sabbath, but reality is the majority of the Christian world keeps Sunday. Uh, from Catholics, Protestants, of all denominations of Protestants, Sunday. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're different. We keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. We stand out, almost like a sore thumb sometimes. Why are we different? What is the big deal? Further, we, um, we teach a few... Uh, we have a few unique teachings. Um, I'm going to read to you from The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White, page 605. And this is in a chapter called The Final Warning. And listen to this. R regard, speaking about the end of time, the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted when the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, when the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not, while the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator, while one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receives the seal of God. Just a powerful little sentence there. It's such a powerful thing. It can be such a strong thing that even watching this video, perhaps you have a non-Seventh-day Adventist watching this with you, and you might, oh, you could cringe. Oh, I didn't know he was going to say something like that or go that direction. We are so distinct on this, this topic that we say, number one in this paragraph here, we teach, the Adventist Church teaches that the Sabbath will be the final exam. I was a teacher for 20 years, so that's the language I know, exams and tests. And all students want to know one thing and one thing alone. You can talk, 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 and they're, yeah, but Mr. Leon, just one question. Yes, what's your question? Will that be on the test? And if the answer is no, then they don't care what you said. Is it on the test? Well, the final exam is the Sabbath. That's what we find here in this, in this uh, book, The Great Controversy, which we as Seventh-day Adventist Church teach. And more than that, we call it receiving, uh, keeping the Sabbath at the end of time is to be called the seal of the living God. We are to be sealed with the Sabbath. And those who keep the uh, false Sabbath are said to receive the mark of the beast. Powerful words. Why? Why couldn't God pick some other doctrine? Why is the Sabbath so important? Especially when our fellow Christians will say, you know, what does it really matter? We're still honoring God. We're still worshiping on Sunday. Why is the Sabbath such a big, big deal? One more, one more uh, quote here from Great Controversy, page 640. Again, speaking at the end of time, just before... We as Adventists know that there will, a cloud will be seen in the sky about the size of a man's hand. That is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. Just before that, there is an event. You can read it all about it in the Great Controversy. It's called the Voice of God. And many things happen that we kind of lump in together with Jesus' second coming. And this is one of them. It says, The voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and the hour of Jesus' coming and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people. Like peals of loudest thunder, his words roll through the earth. The Israel of God stand listening with their eyes fixed upward. Their countenances are lighted up with his glory, and shine as did the face of Moses when he came down from Sinai. The wicked cannot look upon them. And when the blessing is pronounced on those who have honored God by keeping his Sabbath holy, there is a mighty shout of victory. 
Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It is a cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. So we see the very end of time. The Son of Man, the sign, the cloud is just about to appear and the voice of God is heard pronouncing a blessing on those who have kept his true Sabbath. We teach this. To say something, to, these, to, to believe these kind of things is not as simple as, as there are some doctrines that are kind of iffy. Or not, like, for instance, tithing. You could have a good discussion with another Christian about tithing. Do you tithe on the gross amount of your paycheck or on the net? And Christians can disagree about that. But on this issue... The true Sabbath, it's not a matter of, well, we can all disagree but agree that we're okay and we're united in Christ. The words that we've read polarize Christianity. As Jesus might have said, I did not come to bring peace but to bring a sword, to divide. He was coming, he's coming to separate those who are his from those who are not his. That's where we call what we call the Sabbath, the final test on mankind. The question is, begs to be answered. God, why is the Sabbath so important to you? Why is, what is the big deal about the Sabbath? It is, it, how can it be the final exam? How, wouldn't you want it to be on that you are saved by faith, in, in faith in Christ and His blood alone? Wouldn't that be the final test on humanity? Well, let's take a few moments to answer this question from my humble, my humble thoughts sharing them with you. Let's take a look, first of all, at the original meaning of the Sabbath in Genesis. In Genesis, God's creating the earth, and by the sixth day, he had created man, uh, Adam and Eve, and the animals, and all that had been created. On, and Genesis 2-2, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So, well, here, first of all, we can see that God, God is the first person to keep the Sabbath. It is, not a, it is not a human institution, is it? It's not a, an, an institution created and started by the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's not even a, a Jewish tradition coming back to Abraham. This, this goes all the way back to the first one who kept the Sabbath was God himself. God rested on the seventh day. This institution of the Sabbath comes to us from the Garden of Eden itself. Along with marriage, God put Adam and Eve together in marriage on day six, and on day seven, they spend the first Sabbath together. Together, Adam and Eve and God. Wonderful Sabbath. But this tradition, this Sabbath history, comes to us all the way from the Garden of Eden. Ellen White has this beautiful, beautiful sentence in one of her writings that she says, flowers, and I see some flowers up here. Flowers everywhere. If you, next time you see flowers, remember a little phrase Ellen White says, flowers, they are reminders of Eden. Such a beautiful little phrase. Flowers are reminders of Eden. They, they point us back to the Garden of Eden. Can you, can you picture it? Adam and Eve in love with each other, in love with Jesus, their friend, spending the first Sabbath together. How wonderful that day must have been, the Sabbath, the first Sabbath. What was the original intention for the Sabbath? Well, it's stated here. It was, it was an honor to re to remember that God had rested from all his work of creation. Look a little forward to Exodus chapter 20, when the law is given to Moses. And as we learn and study, we, we realize that it's not that the Sabbath was invented with Moses, but it was written down with Moses. But these things were known. God was keeping the Sabbath since the very beginning. But in Exodus chapter 20, Verse 8, it says, 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. There's a point. Again, it's not our Sabbath. It's not man's thing. It's not our holiday. It's not our day of choosing. It's not something we have control. We can pick which one we want. This is God's Sabbath. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Again we see that the original meaning of the Sabbath was to remember that God is the creator. He made the earth. He made it perfect and beautiful. And on, then on the seventh day, he rested from his work. The Sabbath was intended to keep that in our mind forever and ever. We come from God. We're not descendants of monkeys. We're not part, a product of evolution of some unthinking uh, game of chance. We were created out of love. Imagine, remember that first Sabbath. God wakes up Eve. He sees the, the, the pinnacle of God's creation, the most beautiful thing he's ever seen, this woman Eve, who then is in love with him, and they're so happy together, just drinking in the beauty of each other, their characters, and they're laughing, and their, and their appearance, They've, they're in love, and then there's Jesus, their, their creator, laughing and hugging and smiling with them. They're having the most beautiful day. And we were never to forget this. The beauty of our Creator. He is, it says here that we are to remember that in six days, the Lord made the heaven, and the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. He made it all. This idea of creation reminds us that God is love. Think about the situation. You find yourself, what, what today is a, is a figure of speech. Today we have a figure of speech. Say, it's like Eden. It's the Garden of Eden, right? It's so beautiful. It wasn't a figure of speech to them. It was absolutely perfect. It shows God's love. He didn't place them in a place that was ugly with hard work involved. He placed them in the beautiful garden where there was only love and beauty and fun. You know, you can imagine all the wonderful animals, all the sights and the sounds. It was fun. It was beautiful. It was pure. It was holy. It was clean. It was natural. It was lovely. And it was full of pleasure and Oneness, God, Adam, and Eve in unity, loving it, loving the moment. You cannot but picture that Garden of Eden. You can let it run over and over again in your head. What it was it must have been like that first Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. You cannot then come up to any other conclusion but that the one who arranged this wonderful event was a loving, loving God. So the Sabbath reminds us of that God, that he is our God, the God who believes in romance. He didn't put Adam, and Eve, Adam alone. He brought Eve to her. So many people run away from God because they think he's going to take away their fun in the world. God is the one that created Eve for Adam and Adam for Eve. He created romance. He created love. He created this perfect garden for them. The Sabbath reminds us of who our God really is and what he intends for us. When we look around in the world we live in today, the world we live in today is no longer the Garden of Eden, is it? Today, if you're brave enough to walk up to a stranger, they might, you know shun you, like, no, don't talk to me, it's, it's COVID, stay away. The world is scared, and it's, it's a lonely place for some, and it's, 
it's tainted. As we've read in the great controversy for years, it would be a, a taint in the air. Well, that, that has starting, is starting to become true. But when we think back to what God created originally, we know what he is pointing us to. We, the world is the way it is now, but he's, he reminds us of the Garden of Eden so that we can remember where we're headed. He's taking us back to the Garden of Eden. My son, Will, he likes to play this game. So we've told him these stories. He'll take a stick or a broom or anything, and he'll swing it around. And, he, and he's like, you can't come in here. And you might think he's playing some kind of Jedi game. And you ask him, why can't I come in here, Will? And he's like, no, God said you can't come back in. He's playing the angel with a flaming sword that God placed in front of the Garden of Eden. And so we like to play, but I like to pretend like I, I'm Adam, sort of, and I say, but, but, angel, but I'll get to come back in one day, right? And he'll say, yes, yes, God will let you back in. When, and I say, when, you, when I come back with Jesus, right? And he says, yes, when you come back with Jesus. Ellen White tells us that, that one day Adam and Eve will walk back into the Garden of Eden, and guess what? You see, the garden was removed from the earth at the flood, Read this in Patriarchs and Prophets. It was removed from the earth at the flood, taken to heaven, and kept in exactly, perfectly, it's preserved exactly as it was for Adam and Eve. And one day they will enter the garden again. And so that gets the game we play at home. I say, well, I'm coming back with Jesus. You're going to let me in? And he's, oh, yes. When you come back with Jesus, you can come in. Because he's guarding that Garden of Eden for us. The Sabbath reminds us we're going back there. We're going back to that perfectly wonderful paradise with God one day. Turn with me now to Revelation 14, 7. I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to, to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Just jumping ahead here, and it might seem like these two topics are not connected, talking about the Sabbath and the Garden of Eden and the God of creation. And all of a sudden, I'm now at the end of time in the book of Revelation, and we see an angel flying in midheaven, having, my mind said, an eternal gospel. Some versions say the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel, the very, very heart of the Christian message, the very, very heart of the good news in Revelation 6. And it starts off, he says, with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And then read on. The very next words, worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. We're talking about the end of time. The judgment is at hand. Fear God, give him glory. Because the judgment is at hand. The next words are to worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea and the springs of water. Does that sound like a familiar phrase? Him who made the heaven, or made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. How do we worship that person? Because he says to worship. Doesn't that take you back to something a bit familiar? Back in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 8, it said to remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. And back to Genesis, how the Lord God had finished making the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that was in them, and then he rested on the seventh day. You won't find that phrasing in the Bible in a, in a way that points us to the worship of that person, like you will here in Exodus and Genesis. This verse in Revelation 
Revelation 14, 7, is pointing us to something that is very pertinent to those of us alive today. We know we are coming up to the end of time. We are probably living in the very last days as we speak. Events are changing our earth and, our, and the way we live. We can, we can feel it in our bones. The Lord is coming soon. And we know that this final test in Revelation points us to the judgment that's coming and that we are to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Search the scriptures for those phrasing all throughout. You will find it points us to the Sabbath. How else do we worship the Creator? That's what it's telling you to do in Revelation 14. Worship the Creator. Worship Him who created everything. How do you do that? How in Scripture are we told to worship the Creator? To remember the Sabbath day. Still, it doesn't quite answer the question as to why. We see that if I said, why should you keep the Sabbath? If you said, Marco, okay, you're saying it points to God as creator. That, that was good. That reminds me of how good and loving God is and, and what, what he wants to take us back to. It, it, it kind of reminds me of, of this phrase in the book Education by Ellen White. Again, I was a teacher for 20 years, so pardon me for taking a tour down memory lane, but to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. Let me slow it down a bit. Wondering, what is this all about? Why are we here? What is God up to? What is all this drama, this earth? Why are we still here? Why doesn't God just finish it early? What are we doing? Answer, to restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was created. That the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This is the great work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. You see, so, yes, Marco, I hear what you're saying. The Sabbath is wonderful. It points us back to the Garden of Eden. It reminds us of the purpose. What God is doing is restoring in us. He's, he's the creator. He's recreating in us. He's trying to take us back to the Garden of Eden, right? And, and he can't take us back to the Garden as we are. We'd, we'd mess it up, wouldn't we? Right? You can't put a bunch of sinners back in the garden. He's got to make us clean and holy and pure and then take us all back there. So yes, I, I see that when I think of creation, of the Sabbath as a memorial of creation, I, I think of those things and that's wonderful. But if you're saying now, okay, you're taking me to Revelation and you're saying, but the Sabbath is so important because it's the final test on humanity. And you find that in Revelation 14. Okay, I see that. Yes, it's the final test. It's there in Revelation. You made a point. Worship him who is the creator of the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Yes, that points me again to the Sabbath. But why? Okay, so we could pause for an analogy here from going forward back into Revelation. Just for a moment we could see this. The Sabbath gives us rest. Right now the world is in this COVID-19 state of mind, and we're all thinking about rest of sorts. Some people... Like at my job, we don't work Fridays now. And there's a lot of people thinking, why should we do that again? Let's not work Fridays anymore. The world has slow, slowed down a bit. In fact, the, the, the uh, Pope has called the world to a re-education summit. I think it's going to be in October. And to talk about the future of the world. And environment is big on the agenda. Slowing down. There's talk that, that the Pope would like to. There's... There, there's possible people throughout the world, there's possible talk about, can we have a, uh, a Sabbath day? You know, a, a day where the world slows down, and we, we all take a breather, and let the environment recover, and have a better world. There's, there's worldwide talk of this, because we know that the Sabbath gives us rest, and we have, are learning, if we haven't learned yet, that rest is needed. The world needs to slow down. We all need to take a breather. We get recharged by it. 
If, if the God is the one who told us to slow down, then he knows that because he made us. He understands how we're made. It would be like if, if you wanted to ignore the Sabbath, it would be much like uh, any Tesla. Are there any Tesla owners listening to me? Or any electric car owners? Or for that matter, any gasoline car owners? Yes, you all own a car probably. If you ignored the, the light coming on that says you needed fuel, or you ignored the light saying, and I'm not a Tesla owner, so I don't know if you guys have a light or you have, you know, uh, a voice of uh, the Tesla creator behind you saying, you know, you need more electricity. But somehow you get warned you need to slow down. You, if you ignore the need for fuel, you'll run out of fuel, run out of charge, and you'll be stuck somewhere. It would be silly for us to do that. We know we need to pay attention to the instructions from the owner, the manufacturer, and slow down and be recharged. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. What is the Sabbath? Here it is. We're getting, we know the original intention was for, to point to creation, but God tells us there's a deeper meaning, another meaning, perhaps an even more significant meaning. He says, the Sabbath is a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. It's a sign between two people. A sign between me and you, God says. The Sabbath, it's our sign. Look, look, back, uh, look back in Ezekiel, just, just a little bit. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 16. Let's read a little love story here. Ezekiel 16. It's a love story. We're talking about love stories. We're talking about Eden love stories. Now let's talk about another love story. God in Israel. He says in Ezekiel 16, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. And say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. No, I looked with pity on you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown into the open field, for you were abhorred on the day you were born. This is a horrible picture. When I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, Live. Yes, I said to you while you were in your blood. Live. Horrible picture here. This is a baby thrown into a field in its own blood to die. And Jesus walks by this baby. And he says, live. He speaks life over this pathetic, terrible scene. Live. I made you numerous like the plants of the field. Then you grew up, became tall, and reached the age for fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. Are you picture following this? He says, live to this child. And this baby girl then grows, 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 till maturity. And when he walks by her, he sees that she is now a young woman, beautiful, a beautiful young woman, and that she it is ready for the time for love. I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord. Do you understand this picture? He takes this woman, wraps her in his own clothing, brings her to him. He makes her his wife. He takes her to himself. It is a love story. He has saved her from death as a, as a child, and she has grown, and now he is in love with her. She is in love with him. He takes her for his own, and they are one. They are in love together. Then I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. 
I also clothed you with embroidered cloth and put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet and wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands and a necklace around your neck, and I put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. He makes her his wife, and he, he dresses her in the finest. There's one thing I want you to pay attention to. Besides the love story, he takes her, she's his, he marries her, she's his wife. He puts rings on her. He puts a golden ring on her nose. In the scriptures, you would never find a man wearing a ring in his nose. The only time a man would ever have a ring in his nose is when he's become a prisoner and he's taken away captive, which they would do sometimes. They would actually put a hook in their nose and drag them sometimes. It was a sign of, I belong to someone. I am not my own. It is maybe the ancestor of our wedding ring. He gave her a golden ring, and she put this in her nose. She belongs to him. You could see this again, this, this uh, verse, this idea of the, the ring in Genesis 24. In Genesis 24, you remember... You remember the servant who went to find a wife for Isaac? And Genesis 24, 22, when he had found the perfect woman through, through prayer, he knew that she was the one that God had ordained. Or his prayer was answered miraculously. Uh, Genesis 24, 22, Then it came about when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel, and two bracelets for her wrists, weighing ten shekels in gold. A, he took a gold ring. He gives her a gold ring. The woman wearing the gold ring, whether it was on the nose or wherever else, it was a sign she was belonging to another man now. She belonged to someone. That's what you're seeing a symbol of. So we read this story, this love story of the baby become the woman, become the wife. In Ezekiel 16, we understand the, the, sim, the symbolism of the ring. She belongs to him. And then we go back to Ezekiel 2012, and we see that idea in a little bit different light. We see that I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the one who sanctifies them. First of all, I want you to understand the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. A very intimate sign. Do we have such a thing today? The wedding ring. The wedding ring. It's a symbol between two people that you are mine, I am yours. And God is, God is now pointing us to this symbol that is his ring around his people. The Sabbath, it is a sign between me and you. The ring can mean so many things. Sometimes people get carried away with the value of it in terms of dollars and bling and shine and all that. But it is really represents a relationship and the strength of a relationship. I, I chose tungsten ring. I liked it because, well, one, it didn't cost a lot of money. But two, I liked it because it's tungsten. Tungsten is one of the strongest materials on earth. So I thought that was a great symbolism of a marriage. It can't be broken. It's tungsten. A fireman friend told me that they, the firemen don't even wear rings like this because it, in a fire, they wouldn't be able to come off their finger if it got started to melt on them or something. So, and tungsten can't be cut. So a fireman would never wear a tungsten ring. You know, because if there was an emergency and they needed to take it off, they couldn't. They couldn't cut it. And that's, that's a great symbolism for marriage, though. Tungsten. A ring. The ring can sometimes mean more off than on. I have a very good friend. He didn't know he was heading down the road for divorce. He knew things were getting bad, awkward, tension. One day... 
coming home, his wife coming home, he, he noticed her hand. And he said, hey, what happened to your wedding ring? Oh, it's, I'm just not wearing it. It's, it's, it's in the drawer. Really? He, uh, he didn't even know how to respond. How do you respond to that? It, how do you explain the depth of your heart there? What do you, what do you, you you're, you're not wearing the ring? I mean, and so in her nervousness, she, rea- she responded very quickly. Oh, oh don't, don't, don't think anything of it. Don't, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, it didn't match. My, uh, my other jewelry is silver. The ring was gold. It just didn't go with what I was wearing. And in his, in his not wanting to dig into the, the difficulties and the pain and the hurt and the distance that was already coming into the marriage, he let it go. But friends, hearing the story, could read more clearly what he couldn't see at the time. Does that make sense to you? I, I didn't have the ring on. Do you see the symbolism there of how powerful that ring, what that can say... And God is saying that the Sabbath is this sign between me and you. I'm going to just pause there for that reason alone. Some of you have been through divorce and know that kind of pain. Maybe you've had an apparent abandon you or reject you. You know that kind of pain or a child reject or abandon you. You know that kind of pain. The pain that broke Jesus' heart on the cross. You ever think about that? When we go through these things, divorce and death, it was those kind, that kind of pain is what killed Jesus on the cross. But it wasn't even the death because you can say goodbye to your loved one. Like my grandmother, when she died, said goodbye to my grandfather. And there can be tears and hugging and it can be still a sweet time. But divorce means I'm still alive and I don't want you anymore. There's a pain that can come with that. There's a, there's a depth that can come from that kind of suffering. And God is saying that the Sabbath is this symbol between the two people. So pause here for a moment. Why is the Sabbath such a big deal? Still not sure, but do you want to have the ring on your finger or not? If, if God says, this is, this is my ring, will you wear my ring? How do you feel? How do you explain to God that you don't want to wear his ring? Is it because it's, you know, my, my wife's ring is aquamarine. It's not a diamond. Again, I didn't see the point in spending a vast amount of money. We'd both been divorced. And so I thought, hey, I'm going to get something that truly symbolizes. I got an aquamarine and matched her eyes. And that's the first thing I ever noticed about her. Sat down next to her on a bus in Nashville. And I said, who is this pretty lady? sitting next to me, with eyes the color of aquamarine. There's a symbolism in that. Do you want to have the symbol of the Sabbath? Do you want to, how can you explain to God, I'm not wanting your symbol at all? For that reason alone, I think it it gives me pause. God, does it mean this much to you? Really? Really? It is your thing? Hmm. But, Now let's get to the the final point of the sermon, of the talk. Look at the rest of the verse. It is a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So here it is. What does the Sabbath symbolize? Besides being a sign between God, besides pointing to the Sabbath, it, it symbolizes this fact. It is God who sanctifies us. All right, let's let's camp on that thought. You cannot save yourself. You cannot be good enough. You can't work your way into heaven. You can never make yourself righteous and holy. The good news is, give up trying because God did it for you. God will do it for you. God says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. We said, perhaps the Sabbath is not a big enough thing. Perhaps it should be that your salvation comes from faith in the the works in Christ. A righteousness by faith in Christ alone. Wait a minute. What is the Sabbath the symbol of? The Sabbath is the symbol of that God is the one who does it all. You can't do it. You can't 
sanctify yourself. Sanctify means to make holy. You cannot restore yourself to the perfection of the Garden of Eden. You can't do it. You're a sinner. You're lost and broken. I'm lost and broken. But God says, I will sanctify you. I will change you. Now that becomes, now we're starting to hit on a very beautiful meaning to the Sabbath. The Sabbath points us to salvation comes completely and wholly and only from Jesus. His life in us. His gift to us. It is the sign between me and you that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. What a beautiful symbol. As long as you are wearing that ring and you are saying, I am with you, God. You are my God. I am here. You're that woman. If you, re- if you keep reading Ezekiel 16, that woman goes off and leaves her husband. It's a sad ending to that story. We don't have to be that woman. We can be the one that says, I love you, God. I wear your ready- wedding ring. I am yours. And God says, you stick with me, and I promise I vow to you. What is God's wedding vow? His wedding vow says, I give you my life. I will sanctify you. What a wonderful thing. As long as you don't walk away from him, as long as you stay at home in the marriage with God, he promises to sanctify you. Sanctify you. That is a, that is a gospel message worthy of all our adoration and love for God. How many of you have heard of Jack LaLanne? Probably the younger, younger set doesn't know the name Jack LaLanne. Older people, you remember Jack LaLanne. I even know Jack LaLanne. He was this crazy workout guy. And I, don't, I didn't take the time to look it up, but I know that on his birthdays he used to do feats of, of strength, like, like swim in a, in a river, pulling rowboats with people in the rowboats. At the age of 70, he was crazy. Strong, fit guy his whole life, Jack LaLanne. I once saw an interview with Jack LaLanne. I never forgot. He said this. You know, he said, when I was looking for a wife, it did not matter to me what she looked like on the outside. It didn't matter to me if she was, she needed to lose some pounds, was out of shape, you know, not healthy. That kind of stuff did not matter to me. And the interviewer said, really, Jack, I, I don't understand. How can that be? You're, you're, you're Mr. Fitness. You're all about, the, how could you not care that, you know, the person you marry is going to be a, uh, just this, you know, lazy, unhealthy, unfit person? How, that doesn't make sense. And he goes, no, you, don't, you misunderstand me. He says, I wasn't worried what she would look like when she married me. Because any woman that would marry me will get in shape Let me tell you, let me give you that promise. Any woman that will marry me will get in shape. He's Jack LaLanne. You couldn't live with Jack LaLanne and not get in shape. And that's what he knew. He said, you give me a woman. I want to look on the inside. I want to find out who she is. Let me not see her character. Let me fall in love with her. And if she will stick with me, if she will consent to be my wife, I will get her in shape. Do you see the promise from God? You stick with God. You keep the ring on your finger. You keep going home to him every night. He makes a promise. He will sanctify you and make you holy. Now this brings us full circle. We're going to kind of wrap this up now. Let's go back to Revelation 14. We're in Revelation 14, and again, we're reading about the everlasting gospel Revelation 14, 6, the angel flying in heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the best news, the eternal news, the once and for all, all time. This is the gospel message. In verse 7, fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. Remember, the judgment has come, therefore remember the Sabbath. Come to the Sabbath. Now, can you see why the Sabbath? If the judgment is impending, if it's on the very verge, we better be ready, shouldn't we? We better be holy. We better be in the perfection that God is looking for in his people. And how are we to do that? We will fail every time we try to do it ourselves. The only way we can 
achieve that perfection that God is looking for in his people. The only way is for God to do it for us. And what, what is the symbol of that, the holiday that memorializes that? It's that weekly holiday called the Sabbath. More than this, I want to point you to this part of this verse in verse 7. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment. Whose judgment? The hour of his judgment has come. God's judgment? What are you talking about, God's judgment? What does God need to be judged for? God, God doesn't need to be judged. That doesn't make any sense to me, God being judged. Why would God need to be judged? Look at Romans 3, 4. Romans 3, verse 4 says, May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Who are we talking about there? We are talking about God himself. God, may you be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. What in the world would God be judged about? How can there be a judgment on God? And what does it have to do with us? There is a judgment that comes upon the world. Something has been missing. There is an accuser out there, isn't there? There is somebody out there that has started an accusation against God, that God is not just, that he is not love, that his ways are not right. And the world has fallen, uh, followed after this ac accuser. The accuser is Satan, and the world has followed after Satan's accusations that God is not love, God is not just. And God says, no, my ways are holy, pure, and right. Follow me, and I will bring you back to the perfection of the Garden of Eden, to perfect love, perfect joy. Satan says, no, God, you are a liar. Your ways are not joy. Your rules are rules, and they are slavery. And God says, no, I am bringing you back to love and Eden and joy. Look in the book of John, chapter 3. Everybody on the planet, for the most part, knows John, chapter 3, at least one verse, right? John, chapter 3, verse 16. Everybody kind of knows that one. But, do you know how the chapter kind of, well, not the chapter, but the section kind of wraps up? The same section here where it's the John 3, 16, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And how does this conversation with Nicodemus wrap up? Uh, verse 19 says here, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Just for a moment here, we're talking about the judgment. Here is the judgment that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. There's something about the things that I do, the things that I am, reflect upon God. Why would they reflect upon God? Because he's the creator. Don't you know that when our kids do something and People say how great our kids are. We take pride in it as parents. When our, parent, when our kids do something embarrassing, like my son Will runs all around the stage up here in the middle of the sermon, it can be embarrassing because it reflects on us. Everything we do in the end will reflect as having been wrought in God. It came from God. God did it through us and in us. There is a judgment on the world. Last verse is Ephesians 3, 9, and 10. Ephesians 3, 
9 and 10. And to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. Again, pointing to the Creator. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. What is to be made known? The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. Think about that for a minute. Why is it that the manifold wisdom, let's just sim simplify it, the wisdom of God might now be made known. If it is to now be made known what was going on previously, the wisdom of God was not known, was it? Something is supposed to happen that the wisdom of God will be made known. And yet before, the wisdom of God was not known. The judgment on God, all that we do reflects us having been wrought in God. You see, God is saying, there is sinful man, but I will die for him on the cross and restore him. And if you will follow me, I will bring you back to the perfection in which you are created. My ways are love, and everything I'm doing is love, and everything I'm pointing you to is love. I made you in love, and I will bring you back to love in the garden. And Satan says, you are a liar, God. You are nothing but a tyrant. You make all these rules that we can't even follow them if we wanted to. You're unfair. You made me the way I am, and now I'm going to have to rot in hell because, because you made me this way. It's not fair. And the world is questioning this argument. Is God right? Or are God's ways wise? Why did God make Satan in the first place? Is, was this wise? I have a friend who was asking me, well, what about the flood? God had to destroy half the world. Was that wise? Why did God do this? He, like he made a big mistake. The wisdom of God is in question. Why does this keep going on? Why do babies die every day in Africa? Why is all this injustice and horrible things happening on the earth? Where is the love of God? There's, there can't be a loving God when the world is like this. The wisdom of God is in question. And the answer to the question, the wisdom of God is to be revealed. The judgment of God is coming. It is time for the church to fear God and give him glory because God's judgment is coming. Let me tie it together. Look again. That the manifold, this is Ephesians again, 3.10, that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. How? How will the wisdom of God be made known? Through the church. Through the church. It is only when the church is restored, when me, when Marco, poor, sinful, broken, messed up guy that I am, and was, when God has restored me into the perfection in which God created man, then the wisdom of God will be seen. When God does that in one, two, three, four, five people, and his church, when his church is restored, when when. When Satan can no longer point to these sinful men and say, See, God, you're, nobody can follow you. But instead, God says, Look it, I took the worst of the worst, the sinners of the sinners, the worst of humanity. I took the dregs of society, and look at them. They walk as God now in holiness and purity. When the church rises up in the perfection in which God intends for the church, then the wisdom of God will be made known. God is waiting for a people that walk perfectly in the character of Christ. Because then when the character of Christ is perfectly reflected in us in as the church, what will everybody see? Where did that character come from? We will all see, all the universe will look and say, yes, we know, that was wrought in God. God did that. God was right. 
God was wise. The wisdom of God will be seen. The final test coming upon the world has to do with the Sabbath and the question about is God wise? Or is he love? Is he right? Is he holy? And the two are melted together because we can't stand in the judgment. We can't be evidence. The judgment of God has come. Give fear God and give him glory. The hour of his judgment has come. We are to be witnesses on the trial. Satan says, God's ways are wrong. And God, Jesus says, I, pre I present exhibit A. Exhibit A is my church. Come up here, church. And he brings his church forward. Like in Revelation, you see the 144,000 standing on the sea of glass, victorious in the perfect character of Christ. You see, you, see, you see these sinners? I redeemed them, and look at them now. You find no spot, no blemish in them. They are perfect and pure. My ways are perfect and pure, and all creation kneels at the feet of Jesus and declares, you are right, you are righteous, you are holy God. The church is the one to reveal the character of God. The church cannot do this until we become holy. Think about that phrase for a moment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How can it ever be true that we truly keep the Sabbath until we who keep it are holy? It's not a matter of the things you do, is it? It's not a matter of whether I swim or don't swim or I work or don't work. It's truly, you can't ever truly keep the Sabbath holy until you are holy. God is waiting to take his church, you and me and our kids, and bring us up into the perfect character of Christ. That he might put us on the witness stand as evidence that his ways are just and that he is love and that he will take us back to the Garden of Eden and that we have every right to be there. That he has redeemed us. This will not happen unless it is the work of Christ in us completely transforming us from the sinners that we are into the righteous character of Christ. We cannot do that kind of work. We can't change ourselves. We cannot make ourselves ready for God's trial. Only God can. He is the only one who can sanctify us. And the Sabbath is the sign, he says, that I am the one who sanctifies you. God's judgment is coming. I want to be found wearing his ring, saying, God, I am yours. I am yours. Every morning of my life, God, I am yours. You said if I married you, God, you would change me into your image. Change me, God. This is happening today around the earth. Around the earth, God's people are saying, God, complete your work in me. Complete the work. Not like my grandfather and my great-grandfather. Not like Elm. Not like the past where you were nice people, good people, holy people. I want the final work. I want to be one of the 144,000. Complete the work in me, God. Restore in me the image of creation. The image of my maker. The image of God. Restore in me. Make me the perfect reflection of the character of Christ. I cannot do this. I rest, God. I rest. The Sabbath is the opposite of legalism. It tells us not to do, but to rest in God. He is the one that will do the work. And I, for one, am, I want to be part of this work, and I want to invite you. Join me. Put on his ring. Be married to God. Stay with him. Stick with him and say, God, I'm yours. Change me. Perfect me into your character. And let's Bring it all home. Amen. <clears throat> Father God, my prayer is for each one listening that your spirit will touch their hearts. The, the times we're living in, Lord, it, we, we see it, we feel it. We're, we're living in the very end, Lord. It's not time to, to live as we've lived in the past. It's time to drop let everything drop aside let everything else go away but but coming close into your presence 
to knowing you, being known by you, to being in that love relationship with you, to being married to you, God, to surrender, absolute surrender, to let every single thing in our lives be taken away. God, take everything away from me that is not from you, that is not in the Garden of Eden, because that's where I'm headed, the Garden of Eden. We're going back, and I'm going to be there with you. Love, God, love. It is, it is time for the church. Let us, let us throw everything else out the window, but except putting on God's ring. Say with me, God, I am married to you. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. Do with me whatever you want, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.